Okay, we're down here on the Intercoastal Waterway, a little bit down from our house. You can see our house on the far right there, the second yellow house. They're here um, putting in oyster shells to increase to uh, create an artificial reef. We've got kids from the Brunswick County Schools and the North Carolina University. I'm not exactly sure what university it is, but we got a whole crew here, and they're also putting in seagrass to help fight the erosion because there's quite a bit of a boat traffic here and lots of wakes that uh, cause erosion. So let's take a walk down to the dock and see what kind of plants they're planting. Okay, we're down here on the St. James uh, kayak dock and here's the plants that they are planting. They're putting in along the coastline here to stop the erosion from the boats. So what kind of plants are these? This is Spartina. Spartina. Yeah, so this is what you see kind of all on the front. Now is this protected or? Spartina. Uh, uh, I mean by regulation or something like that. I, I heard uh, living along the intercoastal here, you, there are some things that you're allowed to cut and other things you're not. Uh, I'm not sure if it's protected uh, because like there's, there's a lot of it. It's just the, the marsh is eroding and right. this is what actually kind of stabilizes the marsh. caught by the rising tide here so they have to uh, suspend operations start out at low tide around uh, I guess 7 38 o'clock this morning and now it's uh, what time is it it's uh, 9 13 and the tide has already come up this time of the month here the uh, the high and low tides are quite high so it comes up pretty quick apparently so they're bringing the grass up and they'll Hi, this is Taylor Ryan. He's one of the organizers of this event. Can you explain to the viewers what uh, what this is all about? This is a project I started about 16 years ago after a meeting with uh, uh, Division of Marine Fisheries and North Carolina Coastal Federation. An oyster cleans 30 to 50 gallons of water per day. And we're building oyster reefs all along St. James Waterway Park and planting Spartina grasses to provide protection from erosion, protection against both wakes, and to provide a habitat for marine life and bird life. Now what are they doing behind us with the net there in the water? They're seining. Seining. The purpose of that is to see what sea life they can come up with and show to the students. About three years ago, just while doing exactly what they're doing right now, they came up with a stingray. And it'd be neat to have that happen again. But this is part of the workshop program that we have for students. And there are 36 students here from South Brunswick High School, which we want to give the opportunity to learn more about our waterway here in Southeast North Carolina. Okay, well, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for being here. <laughs> no problem. Okay, we're down here on the dock we and they have the net up. Reason, which is everybody's been in the water and disturbed uh, it. Yeah, so we're going to keep it over there. Nothing exotic today. Simple question. Taylor called 16 years ago and said, hey, can we do something? And uh, so that's what it's turned into from, from that point on. I am going to take my mask off. I'm going to stay six feet away from everybody, but I'm going to take my mask off real quick. So you guys came out today and you built Living Shoreline. Why did you do it? No you can protect the plants and rows to start as far as I can now on the beach. All right, all right. So should we got we got protection of the plants. We got protection of the soil. Are you asking? Why did we decide to do it? I'm asking functionally what's why. Purpose what's the purpose of, of the living shoreline? I actually old. know that you did it because they told you, hey, get on the bus and come here, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and at least two have been honest enough to say, and I got out of second period. I got out of second and third. It stops quakes. Say it one more time. It stops quakes. 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 Oh, quakes. Right. So that's one of the things that's, that's happening here. So
So the erosion of forces in this environment is mainly from what? Oak waves, right? We actually put a student out here years ago and they sat here with a clicker for an hour. They looked it straight across and they said, how many boats passes this point in an hour? Anybody want to take a guess during the summertime high? 15. 36? Zero. Zero? 50? 100? 147 boats passed that point in a single hour. I was about to say 148. <laughs> so you would have been close. Right? Uh, so, so that's a lot of, of weights. That's a lot of those little, those little waves that are, that are uh, water displacement from the boat. It's a constant force out here. So in some places, erosion is because the river or the currents are moving and they displace the sediments and the, and the other materials. Some places, the main forces of erosion might be storm surge, like a hurricane or something like that. In this particular case, this environment, uh, it happens to be boat waves. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted a solution that didn't involve an engineered, an engineered structure. An engineered structure might be uh, a bulkhead or a, or a, a, a baffle or you know, a constructed sill. And so one of the things we began to do 16 years ago is say, what can we put in this area that is keeping with the, uh, how the area looks and keeping with the natural uh, uh, ecotones that are here and will still do that job. And so we came up with a living shoreline. And several projects, uh, several groups are out there have been working with uh, living shorelines. The Coastal Federation, the Nature Conservancy, and a number of other groups have been working with living shorelines. Uh, and we have colleagues in other states that were working with it. And so we came out here and we said, hey, let's see what we can do here. And we began to bag oyster shell and put it out here. Turns out when you bag oyster shell, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm getting ahead of myself. How many people out here eat oysters? That is the biggest percentage I've ever, I've asked this question for 27 years, and I usually get two people that go like this, and everybody else is like, you can have mine, right? So this the best. It's great to eat oysters, right? We love oysters. There's something great. But, but I'm going to make the argument here that they do something really, really cool while they're in the environment. And so my lab studies something we call ecosystem services. An easy way to think about an ecosystem service is it's that function that either a structure, or in this case an organism provides, uh, that keeps the rest of the ecosystem functioning, right? And so these are, might be called services. Sometimes when you read about them, you'll, call, you'll hear someone call it an ecosystem service. What service do you think an oyster could really provide? I mean, filter. Oh, oh, filtering water. Filtering water. What else? Habitat. We got habitat. All right. Anything else? Say it again. Feeding animals. He says. Oh, okay. So it could act as it could act actually act as a, as a food resource, right? What other ecosystem service? Refuges, right, nice, nice. This is, where's the teacher? Where's the teacher? We got, we got some extra credit. You guys are great. We got some extra credit. <laughs> Dave, what you said about it? Last week. <laughs> Stabilizes the substrate. Yeah, yeah. So oysters, oysters are a specific case of an organism we call an ecosystem engineer because when they build the natural structures that they build, right, they actually uh, create habitat for other organisms. They create refuges for other organisms. They actually, as the structure builds through time, because each generation of oysters lives on the previous generation of oysters, <coughs> They actually create a structure that will hold the sediments in place. The other thing they do is that as currents come through, as water hits this structure, it's, it creates what we call turbulent flow. And so it slows down the particles within the water column. And what do you think happens when it slows down that water? The water slows down. That material settles out. And so when you get around an oyster, sometimes the sediments around it are real fine. Maybe even they're a little soft. And that's because this structure is doing exactly what it's intended to do. It creates that turbulent flow. Say it again. Mud around the oyster pit. Turns out, no, there are no natural systems that create waste. 
There are no natural systems that create waste. If you find waste products, it's something that a human being came up with, right? In the oyster system, they will actually grab particles out of the water column, they sort them between what's food, they ingest that, and what's not food, they bind up together in, with uh, transparent polysaccharides, which is a really fancy way of saying stock, and they expel it as something we call pseudofeces, and all that settles underneath the reef, right? As soon as that settles underneath the reef, bacterial action starts taking place, and the bacteria begin to break up those particles and release the nutrients for the rest of the system to use. So it's a really, really great nutrient cycling system as well. They'll actually deposit directly underneath the, the reef. Think about this, when you guys were walking around that reef, the water around the reef might have been moving very fast, but the water moving through the reef is moving very, very slowly. And so the, it, it provides ample opportunity for the oysters themselves to grab particles out of the water column. Turns out they're not very good at filtering particles if the water's moving more than, say, 20 centimeters a second. How fast is 20 centimeters a second? That's 20 centimeters a second. And so, if it's, not, if it's moving any faster than that, they can't catch it. So the turbulent flow helps slow that down so that they are more effective at feeding. I see your hand up. What you got? How do oysters Excellent question. Excellent question. So I might have referred to the oysters as he when we started this conversation because all oysters start out their lives as boys. They're protandric. So when they first settle, all the little oysters are, are males. And then as they get larger, they will switch over. They have, they have both sets of gametes and they will switch over as they get larger and begin to ripen female gametes. They have external fertilization. And so uh, when the water is warm and the food resources within the water are high, uh, the oysters will send out a signal. And the first oyster to spawn actually releases a pheromone that tells everybody downstream, if you've got right gametes, release them. And so they'll release them all at one time. They need a mechanism to coordinate that. Because keep in mind, these are sedentary organisms, right? And so it's really, really hard to communicate. So they release a chemical that lets everybody around them know that it's time to release whatever whatever gametes they have that are right and they'll release them into the water column. Turns out though they've got they're, they're pretty smart though. They tend to synchronize it on a salinity shock. What would cause a salinity shock in an estuarine system? Low tide. Low tide, high tide, well, you know that's the same order, just moving in and out. What would cause a salinity shock? Waste. Possibly waste. It was coming from a, a big freshwater supply, but I think, I'm thinking of something. I'm thinking of something that we hate to see on a sunny day. Rain. Rain. Right. A big thunderstorm comes in. All this water washes into the creeks. It all gets funneled out. The salinity drops. The signal is sent, and now everybody spawns. Turns out, you guys remember Hurricane Florence? Yeah. Oh, God. oh, it was terrible, right? It was terrible. But the oysters afterwards, they spawned for a month. They kept releasing. And we had an enormous settlement of oysters following the, uh, the, the storm. So while it was bad, and if you happened to be a, a, a sickly or a, or, a, or a weak oyster, you probably didn't make it. But everybody that survived, they spawned and they synchronized their spawning. And we had an enormous settlement of oysters just a month after uh, the storm passed. So again, there are no natural systems that create waste. They utilize everything. They introduce themselves, <laughs> right? Because I completely forgot because I was completely rude. I was so focused on my oysters. So go ahead and start, Elizabeth. Hi, my name's Elizabeth. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a senior at UNCW, majoring in marine biology and minoring in oceanography. And I work in the Benthic Ecology Lab as the St. James Living Shorelines intern. So it is my job to get all the prepare work done so that these events can happen. Very good. Hi guys, I'm Megan. I'm actually a graduate student, but I've been helping in the benthic lab for about four years now. Uh, I'm in the Earth and Ocean Science Department. I'm a geospatial master's student. I'm doing a project on Ballhead Island with their sea turtle program at Drum. Hi, I'm Allie. I am a master's student in the EBS program. I've been helping with the benthic lab for about four years now as well. And I'm working on a project right now that's working with the Department of Marine Fisheries. I'm Michael. I'm a marine biology junior. I just started about two, three weeks ago with the Benthic Lab, and it's been fun. Hi, my name is Jeremy. I'm a junior at UNCW. I'm 
fun so far. <laughs> so very young, eh? Mm -hmm. I'm George. Uh, I'm a grad student in the Benthic Lab, and I study seagrasses and blue crabs. Um, I'm Emily. I'm a senior. I've been in the lab for a year. My major is marine biology, and I just I'm a research assistant, so I work on all the projects. Whoever needs help. Now, Emily also did a DIS with us. Yes. And what was your, your DIS? So there are a couple of crabs in there, and what we are looking at is the parasites that form on those crabs, and what how many has <coughs> one pair, or one crab has how many parasites, and what crab species has. The and we're also looking at salinity changes and how old the oyster is and seeing if that has any contribution. Okay, it is 9.47 in the morning here and you can see how much the tide has come up already. I mean, if the crew was still out there working, they'd be waist deep in water. But they did uh, plant quite a few oyster shells here to make an artificial reef. You can see how the wakes of the boats as they pass the intercoastal uh, really uh, really create quite a bit of uh, turbulence so the oyster reefs are very helpful I talked to them about uh, you know told them that uh, they're more than welcome to put the uh, artificial reef down where we're building our house our house is uh, down here, let's see, see if I can zoom in here, okay, all the way down there, back all the way down towards the end there, that is where we're building our house, and there's a drainage easement where the water comes in, so that would be a good spot for reef. So that's the, uh, that's the wrap up of our little reef project today.